Gentlemen, and welcome to the International Affairs Forum. My name is Jack Siegel. Uh, after the presentation tonight, uh, one of our uh, dear members and uh, esteemed colleagues, will um, Stan Otto, will come up, and uh, he has a lot of experience in Iran. So I just wanted to mention that uh, from '77 to '78, he was a lecturer at the Arya Mayer. Technological University in Isfahan, speaks fluent Farsi. Uh, his colleagues are mostly Iranian university professors. He then was the executive director of the Iran America Society in Tabriz, and he joined the Foreign Service, and there is still a Foreign Service, folks, I wanted to reassure you. Uh, um, and he was political counselor in Berlin, and he helped set up the five plus one talks on the margins of two Secretary of State visits. Uh, so he's been an, an Iran player, I would say, throughout his uh, career, and he now lives in our area. Tonight we have a very special treat, and uh, it, it's about a difficult subject. Iran has a difficult history with the United States. Uh, the issue facing our relationships are complex and they are volatile. After President Trump embraced Saudi Arabia in November of last year, the U.S. effectively aligned itself with the Saudis and by implication on the Saudi side of their multifaceted conflict with Iran. That conflict is playing out right now through a proxy war in Yemen, Iran's support of Shiite militias in Iraq, Iran's military and financial support of Hezbollah in Lebanon and its forces in Syria, and Iran's de facto alliance with Russia in support of the Assad regime in Syria. So there's a lot of Iran activity going on, and of course, I, I'm not mentioning it, but the United States is also deeply involved in each of the events that I just mentioned. Beyond all this is Iran's participation in a nuclear agreement which was reached in 2015 with the US, Germany, France, the UK, Russia, and China. President Trump asserts that the deal is too lenient and that Iran has broken parts of the agreement already. He's called for new sanctions on Iran directed against its Revolutionary Guard Corps, whose commander, Major General Qasim Soleimani, plays a prominent role today in the wars in Iraq and Syria. President Trump has referred the deal to Congress, calling for changes to the U.S. terms. So there's a lot on that agenda, and with us tonight is a true expert and, and a very, very knowledgeable and interesting uh, chap who we've had a chance to meet today. Reza Marashi is research director of the National Iranian American Council, which describes its mission as promoting greater understanding between the American and the Iranian people. He joined NIAC in 2010 as the organization's first research director, and he came to that job after serving in the Office of Iranian Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Prior to the State Department, he was an analyst at the Institute for National Strategic Studies. His organization is primarily funded by the Iranian American community. It does not receive funds from the Iranian government nor the United States government. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reza Marachi. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here. You know, I gotta tell you, this is probably my fifth or sixth time uh, visiting Michigan, and every part of Michigan I go to is different than the last one, and you guys have a beautiful town, and I appreciate you having me out. Now, I wanna be honest with you guys up front. I'm probably gonna talk until about 6.45. There's literally no way that from 6.07 p.m until 6.45, I could cover everything that there is to cover about Iran or U.S.-Iran relations. But what I hope to do is go over what I consider to be a few key points that can then serve as a foundation 
for a Q&A, more of a discussion, as I like to call it, with you guys. We're going to operate on the premise that there's no such thing as a stupid question. So you can ask me about anything that I mention in my remarks, or you can ask me about something that I didn't have the time to get to. OK? Uh, and I think you guys are going to en enjoy it just as much as I know that I'm going to enjoy it. You know, as Jack said in his introduction, uh, the US and Iran have a bit of a challenging and troubled history, particularly since 1979. Like I said before, there's no way that we can go over everything that's happened from 1979 until the present day. But I think it's important to put in context that the relationship between the two countries, generally speaking, hasn't been very good. But the reason for that is not because of the American people. The reason for that is not because of the Iranian people. Leaders make choices. Leaders in Tehran, leaders in Washington. And the consequences and the repercussions of those choices are what impact the people in those two respective countries. So I want to say that up front, and I want to couch in those terms. Everything that we're going to talk about right now is geopolitics. Everything that we're going to talk about right now is the relationship, or lack thereof, between the two governments. And we're going to try to unpack what's been going on, why it's going on, and, and, and where to go from here. Because we've got a lot of decisions as a country that our government is going to have to make uh, in the coming weeks, never mind the coming years, uh, that are going to have a big impact, uh, not just on uh, American foreign policy and national security, but also global security. Okay? So one of the perks of, of coming out here, and I think I said this during, uh, during lunch uh, with my friends that picked me up from the airport, is getting out of Washington nowadays, generally speaking, but nowadays is like a breath of fresh air. Okay? <laughs> And uh, I, I, I say that partly in jest, but I also say that because if you don't leave Washington from time to time, and you just constantly are interacting with the people that you see day in and day out, sometimes arguing uh, you know, with the people, debating with the people that you uh, debate and argue with day in and day out, you're not really expanding your horizons, and you kind of get stuck in a rut. You get stuck in the day-to-day -day monotony. Uh, the benefit for me of coming out here is hearing what you guys think, hearing what you guys have to say, and then being able to take that perspective back to Washington in order to inform what it is that I do. Ostensibly, and I think in practice should be, uh, we should be the ones working for you guys. Uh, and I did when I was at the State Department. And, but I think it should continue to be that way, those of us that work on foreign policy and international affairs, or, or politics as we like to call it, broadly conceived. But up front, I want to tell you guys a dirty little secret about the way that foreign policy and national security works. And it's kind of going to be the framework for everything else that I say going forward. The best argument doesn't always win. And the most intellectually honest argument doesn't always win. And when you work in politics, foreign policy, national security, it's not like brain surgery where you know if you cut to the left, you're going to save somebody's life. And if you cut to the right, they're going to die. This is an imperfect science, foreign policy and international relations. So like I said, best argument doesn't always win. Most intellectually honest argument doesn't always win. And oftentimes, when you're a policymaker, especially when you're a policymaker inside of government, you can think you have the best idea in the world, and then you take it and you put it into your briefing papers or your, or your information memos or your action memos, and, and then you take it into a deputies meeting or a principals meeting uh, or, or, or the important person on the seventh floor of the State Department that you're briefing, and they say, Reza, this is great. And they take out their red pen, and you know what they say? They say, now let's inject some political realism into it. And that's what I mean by the best argument doesn't always win, the most intellectually honest argument doesn't always win. Because injecting political realism into something means we're limiting ourselves to the art of what we perceive to be possible. We're not trying to create new possibilities. And I think this kind of stagnant thinking is bipartisan in Washington, is bipartisan in Tehran, and it's been a big reason why a lot of the obstacles that are plaguing U.S.-Iran relations, or the lack thereof, continue to this very day. So, operating on that premise, there's a couple of things I want to go over that kind of set the stage, I want to flesh them out, 
and make sure we have a good understanding of those particular things. And, and, and I think that that will be the good foundation going forward for the Q&A that we have. Number one, like I said before, it would surprise no one in this room if I told you that the US and Iran aren't exactly best of friends. They haven't been getting along for quite some time. And the question is why? The question is why? Now, I'll be the first to admit that if you ask 10 different people, they might tell you 10 different things. But the interesting thing, the, the thing that's less discussed, almost never discussed, is not so much all of the negative things that the Iranian government does, of which there are many. So let's tick off a few that, in my personal opinion, things that the Iranian government does that are uh, reprehensible. Chronic human rights abuser authoritarian government. Even though it has elections that are neither free nor fair by international best practices and standards, it still has elections that trump anything in the vast majority of the Arab world. And the elections in Iran actually matter. Nevertheless, the elections are not free or fair by international best practices and standards. So you have a chronic human rights abusing government, authoritarian with elections that are neither free nor fair by international best practices and standards. Uh, arbitrary detentions. Uh, of, of, of anybody that go, that's willing to go against the grain of what a government prerogative is. And even sometimes when they have government approval to do something, there'll be members of the deep state that will come in and imprison people. One of them was my, friends, a, 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 was my friend, a Washington Post reporter by the name of Jason Rezaian. Another one uh, was a mentor of mine at a consulting firm that I worked at who's still in prison in Iran right now. And his father just got uh, released into house leave. So these kinds of things hit close to home, okay? So could it be those particular as, uh, actions, those particular aspects of Iranian government policy that dictate why the United States has the approach that it has towards Iran? I would argue no. I would argue no. And the reason why I argue no is because the Saudi government isn't any better, the Emirati government isn't any better, the Egyptian government isn't any better when it comes to these kinds of issues of democracy, human rights, civil society, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. I would say the vast majority, if not all governments in the Middle East, have these problems. Iran is not unique in that regard. And I want to be clear, that doesn't absolve the Iranian government. It's to only say that that's not the metric that determines whether or not the United States views you as a partner or a rival, adversary, competitor. So if it's not what we traditionally consider to be American values that determine the relationship that America has with governments in the Middle East, what is it? I would argue that it's more practical geopolitical interests that dictate what kind of relationship the United States has with governments in the region. More to the point, and more specifically, I would argue to all of you, that since the end of World War II, when the British were kind of running the show in the Middle East, and they were kind of the superpower in the Middle East, the British pulled out, they withdrew from the region, and there was a power, there was a power vacuum. And the United States stepped in and was the guarantor for security in the region. They set up a framework or an architecture for security in the region. Now we do this, we the United States, we do this pretty much in all parts of the world. We have a framework or an architecture for security in Asia, Africa, the Americas, Europe, you name it. Now each framework looks a little bit different depending on the political realities both in Washington and that particular part of the world. But as the superpower, the only superpower in an increasingly multipolar world, but that's another question for another day, we still are the most powerful country in the world. And we set the terms for security in every single part of the world. Sometimes we have willing participants in the framework or the architecture for security that we set up. Sometimes we don't. So in the Middle East, the Saudis, the Emiratis, uh, pretty much all the, Persian, all the Persian Gulf countries, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Israelis, they very much participate in the framework for security that we've set up in the Middle East. But since the end of World War II, when we stepped in to fill the power vacuum, there have been a handful of countries 
that have been unwilling to play by the rules of the game that the United States has set up. Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Assad's Syria, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Do you, do you sensing a recurring theme here? So my point to you is that America has interests and it has values. And we try our very best as American policymakers to factor both interests and values into the policymaking process. Of course, as US government officials, democracy, human rights, freedom of the press, freedom of, the re freedom of religion, civil society, all of these kinds of things are very clearly American values that we hold near and dear to our heart. But the other side of the coin are more practical geopolitical interests. And in the Middle East, I would argue, personally I would argue, that it's political stability, notice I didn't say democracy, I said political stability, those are very different things, to secure stable access to energy resources, not for us, but to the rest of the world. And there are other things that you could throw in there, but I make the argument that those are the two biggest things that guide American interests in this part of the world. Now, if we can pursue those interests while simultaneously promoting our values, absolutely we're gonna do it. But we don't live in a perfect world. And precisely because it's not a perfect world, we are often forced to choose. And what do you think we choose when forced to choose 100% of the time, in my assessment, between interests and values? Interests, precisely. And that is why our values are not the metric for how we establish and maintain relationships with governments in the region that are across the board authoritarian. Right? That is the biggest reason in my assessment. Let me give you a, a tangible example of what I'm talking about. If I was to say to you guys that 15 of, 19, 15 of the 19 9-11 hijackers were of Saudi origin, you would probably say to me, yeah, we know. What would you say then if I told you that there are people that are trying to sue the Iranian government for culpability for the 9-11 attacks? Doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of terrorism-related cases that you can sue the Iranian government for. 9-11 isn't one of them. And it wasn't until very recently that a judge ruled that you could proceed with lawsuits against the Saudi government regarding culpability for 9-11. It, it wasn't the executive branch that tried to move forward with some level of accountability. It was the judicial branch. And even then, it remains to be seen whether or not these lawsuits will play out the way that, uh, that the people introducing these lawsuits hope for them to play out. But it just kind of goes to show, I think that's a tangible example, one of many that would demonstrate that, again, while we hold interests, uh, excuse me, values very near and dear to our heart, they are not the only thing that guide what we base our policies on. And in fact, I would argue that our more practical geopolitical interests are what dictate, are what's dictating the kind of relationship we have with some governments in the region and the kind of relationship that we do not have with governments in other parts of the region. So that's one. Two, I would argue that precisely because the Iranian government is unwilling to play by the rules of the game that we've set up in the region, there are a variety of flashpoints that could produce a larger conflict between the US and Iran, okay? You might not be surprised to hear this, ladies and gentlemen, but the Middle East isn't exactly the most stable region in the world. It's very combustible. <laughs> and precisely because it's very combustible, and precisely because the United States and Iran are extremely active in a variety of theaters across the region, in very close proximity to one another, one would think that it would be in the interest of both sides to, at the very least, try and have a bat phone on each other's desk to pick up and say, hey, um, we're conducting some operations and I'm not targeting you, so uh, don't be in this place at this time. And for a little while that was happening. 
off and on. Today it's not. And, and before I continue, let me explain to you why that's, why that's problematic for American interests. That is problem, the, the lack of dialogue in a very contentious, very volatile region is problematic for American interests because when you are not communicating, ladies and gentlemen, you are miscommunicating. And when you miscommunicate, you misperceive. You miscommunicate, you misperceive. And when you misperceive, you miscalculate. And it's when you start miscalculating that really bad and really dangerous things can happen. And we've seen that over and over and over again in this part of the world. And we've seen it over and over and over again as part of our policies and strategies, or lack thereof, in this part of the world. So, U.S. and Iran, close proximity, very volatile region, not a lot of conversing going on, uh, and that fuels misperceptions, miscalculations. We're talking Iraq, we're talking Syria, we're talking Afghanistan, we're talking Yemen, we're talking in the Persian Gulf itself. I mean, those are just five off the top of my head. And there's, we could probably get up to as many as 12 if we wanted to list them all off. Why do I say all of this to you? I say all of this to you to point out that since 1979, precisely because the relationship between the two countries hasn't been good, and Iran has not been willing to play by the rules of the game that we've set up, we've tried everything in our power to resolve these problems, many of which predate the Iraq war, and some of which have been subsequent, like Syria and so on and so forth. We've tried everything that we could think of to solve these problems without Iran at the same negotiating table that's being used to try and solve the problem. And it hasn't worked. Why is that? The reason why is actually not unique to Iran. It's unique to a principle in diplomacy that I believe in very deeply that I want to share with you guys right now, which is durable solutions to conflict require the buy-in of every country with the capacity to wreck the solution. So, does anybody in this room believe that we could have a durable solution to the conflict in Iraq if the United States wasn't at the negotiating table? Of course not. That's crazy talk. But it's equally crazy to say that we could have a durable solution to the conflict in Iraq without Iran at the table. Because Iran is a player in Iraq, whether we like it or not. Now, we have the ability to help shape what kind of player they are. We can't determine it. We don't have all-encompassing powers, but we have a lot of leverage, and we have a lot of influence, and we can choose how to wield it to shape over time, to cultivate over time the kind of outcome that we want. So durable solutions to conflict require the buy-in of every country with the capacity to wreck the solution. And the United States and Iran really aren't talking about much of anything right now when it comes to a variety of very challenging national security issues in this part of the world. This brings me to the nuclear deal. And let me just check the time real quick to make sure I'm not going over. Good, we got time. So this brings us to the nuclear deal. Bit of a backstory to bring everybody up to speed in case, you, in case you're not hip to the game. In 2015, the United States, together with the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China, it's called the P5 plus one, it's the acronym that's used to describe these six countries, negotiate with Iran a nuclear deal that verifiably ensures that Iran cannot build nuclear weapons. And in return, we lifted some, but not all, sanctions that were on Iran. There's a variety of sanctions that the United States has put on Iran since 1979 for a variety of reasons, some of which were related to Iran's nuclear program, others related to human rights, state sponsorship of terrorism, uh, the embassy seizure many moons ago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those were left untouched on the books. The only sanctions that were lifted or waived were the ones that we put in place related to Iran's nuclear program. 
Now, what does it mean when I say it verifiably ensured that Iran cannot build a nuclear weapon? Because this is an important detail that oftentimes gets glossed over. So in order to build nuclear weapons, you have to look at the supply chain of a country's nuclear program, meaning literally what they're getting from the ground and processing through multiple steps that eventually can produce a nuclear weapon, okay? Now, when I say verifiably ensures that they can't build a weapon, what I mean is every single step of that supply chain is being monitored 24-7, 365, with state-of-the-art technology that has never been used before on any other country's nuclear program. And you want to know why? It's because this technology is so intrusive that no sovereign country was willing to allow it be brought in by an international organization or foreign country to monitor what it considered to be its own sovereign nuclear programs. So it's actually a pretty good deal. It became the gold standard for non-proliferation agreements going forward, it was meaning it was going to be used as a model that would then be applied to other countries that we had a fear uh, of potential proliferation risk, right? And I remember back in 2000, like I had the good fortune of being able to go to a lot of these negotiations with observer status, so I wasn't in the room when they were negotiating it, uh, but I was able to meet with the various delegations when they weren't negotiating with one another. Um, and uh, it was an exciting time. And the reason why it was particularly exciting for me and, and for a lot of people that were in the US government at this time was that things that either weren't happening and that you would hope would happen one day or things that you never thought were possible were happening on a daily basis. There's a gentleman by the name of Gary Seymour, one of the smartest minds on non-proliferation in the United States. Um, served in the first term of the Obama administration and then uh, left the Obama administration to go into an organization called United Against Nuclear Iran, a very hawkish organization that was against any kind of deal with the Iranian government and certainly against the deal that was agreed to in 2015. Uh, Gary was deeply skeptical that we could get the Iranians to agree to anything. But when the terms of the agreement were released, the hundred some odd pages, and that's not including any of the annexes that fleshed out even more detail. I mean, this was a beast of a document, okay? And he read through it, and he ended up resigning from the organization because he said, I support this agreement. This is better than I thought it would be. So I can't work for an organization that opposes it. So there was a lot of interesting things that were happening in Washington at the time. And it was a contentious debate in Washington, right? It was a very, very contentious debate, but eventually it got, it got blessed by Congress, uh, which wasn't exactly necessary, but it certainly helps, right? You don't want the executive branch doing one thing while Congress is doing another. You know, kind of that old saying about the right hand not knowing what the left is doing. You'd like things to be in lockstep when possible. And fortunately, it worked out. Um, today, not so much. Today, not so much. Uh, we've hit a rough patch, okay? And, and we've hit a rough patch for a variety of reasons. Um, I always like to say that when you have a multilateral negotiated agreement, it's kind of like a car engine. What do I mean by that? It's like a car engine because if you don't use that multilateral agreement as a foundation for additional diplomacy, on other points of contention in your relationship with a particular country or set of countries, then all of those other problems start to seep into the one thing that you've solved, and it becomes very corrosive, right? So if the Iran nuclear deal was the engine of a car, then all of the diplomacy that was happening between the US and Iran and Europe and, and Russia and China and Iran on other issues related to Syria, Iraq, you name it, that was the motor oil that was going into the engine, that was helping the engine run. Once that diplomacy stopped, the engine became very corrosive, and the car is starting to break down now. So not only have all of the other problems, all of the other points of contention that we disagree on, not only have they gotten worse, not only have those problems exacerbated, but the one thing that was working is starting to slowly but surely not work anymore. That begs the question, 
what happens if on May 12th, when uh, a decision is due, uh, the United States chooses to withdraw from the agreement? So just to s set the scene for you here, uh, every three to four months, the United States has to renew sanctions waivers that were granted to Iran as part of our obligations under this nuclear deal from 2015. And uh, the United States government has said that we want the European governments, the UK, France, and Germany, to join us in unilaterally renegotiating some terms of the agreement to uh, make it more robust, let's say. All right? And we have said that if the Europeans don't join us in doing so, then we will withdraw from the agreement. So we've presented our European partners with a bit of an ultimatum. So since that happened a couple of months ago in January, late January, early February, uh, we've set up working groups between the United States and the E3, as they're called, UK, France, and Germany. And we've been trying to troubleshoot through these uh, improvements to the agreement, uh, as our government is calling them. And so far, we have not been able to to, uh, to reach the goal that was set. So obviously, we still have some time on the clock, but there's no guarantee that we'll get there. And even if we do get there, there's only one person who's really the decider. So depending on what he thinks, it could go either way. We don't know, right? So that's kind of where things stand now with regards to the agreement. Um, the Europeans have made it very clear that they're not interested in renegotiating the terms of the agreement, but what they are willing to do is to continue to faithfully implement the agreement, and then outside of the agreement, in a new agreement, address all of the various issues that the United States government has a problem with vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Let's say ballistic missiles, or human rights concerns, or state sponsorship of terrorism, or Iran's policies in Syria, Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll see if we're able to make progress on that front. Right now, it's not looking very good, but um, you know, as the clock slowly starts to move towards midnight, uh, funny things can happen in a negotiating room. So never say never. But um, in the intelligence community, we oftentimes assess things with a high, medium, or low level of confidence. Uh, in my personal view, I have a low level of confidence that the United States and our three European partners are going to be able to find a way to square this circle before May 12th. I hope I'm wrong. Actually, I pray I'm wrong. Now, if we choose to withdraw from the agreement on May 12th, well, that could mean a lot of different things, some worse than others. Ten more minutes. First, it depends on how we withdraw. Right? We could potentially say, we, the United States, are going to withdraw from this agreement. However, we're not going to snap back sanctions that would punish Europeans for doing legitimate business as outlined in the nuclear deal. So it's basically saying, we're not a party to it anymore, but Europe, you continue to go and do what you have been doing. Oh, and yes, we will pocket all of these other concessions, Europe, that you're giving us on uh, ballistic missiles, human rights, state sponsorship of terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. In my personal assessment, that would very likely be the best case scenario. But it's not the most likely scenario, in my view. Uh, option number two is we withdraw the Europeans stay in, meaning our, uh, we are not able to convince or, co or coerce them to go along with us, and then it becomes a bit of a standoff between us and our allies. And we'll have to make a very difficult decision on whether or not to enforce sanctions that are extraterritorial, right, because these aren't European sanctions, these are unilateral American sanctions, that are executive branch sanctions. They're not even congressional sanctions. All the congressional sanctions are still on the books. They never came off. So do we enforce those sanctions and sanction our European partners for doing business that is deemed legitimate under the nuclear deal? And if we do, does that start a trade war? Who knows? Do they take us to the WTO? What recourse do they have? What steps do they choose to take 
to push back. If they say no, we will not be cooperative, nor will we be coerced. Kind of becomes a game of chicken, right? Remember those old James Dean movies where two cars are driving towards the end of the cliff to see who will pump the brakes first? Yeah, it's pretty reckless. But that's the situation that we could find ourselves in if we withdraw without having an agreement in advance of withdrawal with the Europeans. Another scenario, and I call this the doomsday scenario, is we withdraw and we immediately snap back all of the sanctions. And by all of the sanctions, I don't just mean American sanctions. I also mean European sanctions and UN Security Council resolution sanctions. Because if you've actually read this nuclear deal, which I have more times than I care to admit, the United States has full authority and does not need permission from any other signatory to deem what compliance and non-compliance means in the agreement, in the nuclear deal. So if the US just decides Iran's not in compliance, never mind whether or not they have evidence, we can snap back all of the sanctions without any permission from any of our partners or the Russians or the Chinese. Now, of course, there's a cost associated with that, right? It goes back to the scenario that I outlined before of what do the, what do the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese choose to do if we go down that route. Now, I don't necessarily think that our government, the United States government, wants to pick a fight with the Europeans. And I think they've demonstrated that um, just last week. You know, we, uh, we bombed uh, a couple of facilities in Syria after some alleged uh, use of chemical weapons. And we did that in concert with the Brits and the French, which goes to show that our government does value our allies and partners in Europe. Rightfully so. But even best of friends can have differing policy prerogatives from time to time. That's never the question. But diplomacy, at the end of the day, isn't about talking to your friends. It's about talking to your enemies. And, and this is the dirty little secret that a lot of people in Washington are having a tough time wrapping their heads around right now. We're having all of these conversations about Iran rather than having conversations with Iran. We had a variety of channels that were painstakingly established to discuss all of the issues that I've outlined for you tonight, and a lot that we're not, frankly, going to have the time to cover in my remarks. We had it through the executive branch in the White House. We had it through the State Department. We had mill to mill. We had intel to intel. And then we had this thing that's called the Joint Commission that was established as part of the nuclear deal, where every three months, all parties to the agreement get together, sit around a big table, and troubleshoot what's working in the agreement, what's not, how can we fix it. And then that provides the opportunity to have bilateral discussions, where you can discuss not just the nuclear agreement, but also other points of concern. For example, there are currently uh, American citizens imprisoned inside of Iran. It's a great opportunity to pull Iranian officials to the side and say, hey, it would be really nice if you let our guys go, right? But it's even better if you're able to do that through multiple channels. And right now we only have one, and we're not using it for much of anything, unfortunately. So where does all of this lead, right? Where does all of this lead? And, and, and this will be the last thing that I say, because this is kind of my take-home point when it comes to U.S.-Iran relations and the options that the United States has at its disposal. Because the, the, these are the choices that we're going to have to make going forward. A lot of times you'll see headlines in the newspaper or on television related to Iran that talk about a whole variety of options at our disposal to address the challenges that the Iranian government presents. I beg to differ. I think, personally, in my assessment, we have two choices, two options, excuse me, only two, war or diplomacy. That's it. Everything else, whether you're talking about sanctions or cyber warfare or secret assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists, all things that we've done, they are stalling tactics that kick the can down the road and delay the inevitable choice between war and diplomacy. 
Another dirty little secret that they don't tell you, every war ends with a negotiation of some sort. So everything that happens before the negotiation, including war, is for leverage, to stack up as many bargaining chips as possible for the inevitable day when you have to sit at that negotiating table to try and cash in your chips. So the State Department trained me to believe that diplomacy is a very powerful tool in the American Foreign Policy and National Security Toolkit. And it's a tool that should be used as much as possible. Because it costs very little, and the dividends of investing in it in a sustained fashion can be plentiful. Can be plentiful. Would you be surprised if I told you that we spend more money as a country on the US military's band than we do on our diplomatic corps? Because we do. That's a fact. And we're actually trying to cut the budget of our diplomatic corps right now. And we are gutting our diplomatic corps as we speak. The problem with that, regardless of who's doing it, is that as the old saying goes, as I said to my friends over lunch today, if all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen, diplomacy without the military is like an orchestra without the instruments. You need the military there. You need that credible threat of force in the background when you're negotiating with your adversaries. It's always helpful for them to know that that option is there, but it's supposed to be the last option. It's supposed to be the last resort. It's supposed to be used to increase your leverage at the negotiating table. It's not supposed to be the first tool that we reach for when we try and solve problems, whether they be in the Middle East or other parts of the world. So what I would offer to you going forward when we think about US-Iran relations is we have a lot of tools in our national security and foreign policy toolkit that we're not currently using, but we should be. And looking forward, as our government makes decisions on how to move forward with regard to Iran policy, I would say two things, and, we'll and then I'll stop and we can open it up for Q&A. One, ask yourselves, are we using the, all of the tools in the toolkit? Have we really and truly exhausted all of the resources at our disposal before potentially considering the military ones, which are always there? They're, and they always, they always will be, they always should be, but they should always be the last resort. And then two, in the run-up to the Iraq War, we as a country didn't have the kind of conversation that we needed to have not only about whether or not it was a good idea, but the costs in terms of blood and treasure for our country. And we've paid a bit of a price for that. Regardless of whether or not you think the war was a good idea or a bad idea, I don't think anybody in this room would debate that we've paid a tremendous cost for it, even if you think the costs were worth it. So going forward, I truly believe, and I would encourage all of you to reflect on the idea of having that conversation as a country going forward, if in fact we start to seriously consider whether or not we're going to engage in any kind of military operation with regards to Iran or any other country in the region. It's not to say that we shouldn't, because sometimes that actually is the best course of action. But it should never be a course of action if we as a country haven't had that kind of discussion. Never mind congressional authorization, which, which hasn't been happening for, for really any of the military operations that we've conducting in the, in, in the region uh, of late. And the reason why it's important for us to have that kind of conversation going forward is because if we're going to sustain any kind of operation that's going to be viewed credible internationally, it has to be viewed credible at home. And it has to have the kind of sustained support at home that's going to be necessary because there's going to be no quick fix to any kind of military operation or any kind of war that we may choose to begin going forward. So I hope in this short amount of time, 
I've laid out a little bit of the backstory, a little bit of what's got us here, and a little bit of where we could potentially be going. But like I said, there was no way I was going to be able to cover everything, but that's why I look forward to the Q&A that's going to be starting momentarily. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to chat with you, uh, and thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, President. I'm looking for a stand. There he is. You're the man. Stand the man. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we, we can go over, I think we have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes for Q&A. And we can go over a couple, maybe, of the questions we did at lunch first. Sure thing. Because we were talking about the situation in Iran, mm -hmm. as it is now, the social situation and things. And maybe you could just talk a little bit about how, how the the society is evolving right now. You know, the last time I saw Iran was 40 years ago. Yeah. Things have changed. Absolutely. Have they changed for the better? <laughs> yeah. So this is a good question. This is an, and it's an important question. Um, and let me be crystal clear. There is a sizable gap between state and society inside of Iran. And the political, economic, and social aspirations of the Iranian people have been long unmet on a variety of fronts. So on the one hand, you have a very diverse socioeconomic swath of Iranian society that is actually, I don't like to say the most pro-American, I like to say the least anti-American population in the region, including Israel. The least anti-American population in the region, I would say, uh, is Iran. However, it's a savvy population they're able to differentiate government policies from the people that we have inside of our country here in the United States. So like I said in the beginning of my remarks, they have no problem with the American people. They have serious problems with the US government policies towards their country, particularly as it relates to sanctions and other forms of conflict. Now, that being said, that's not their primary gripe. Their primary gripe is, again, political, economic, and social aspirations that have long gone unmet. And that's one of the most powerful aspects of Iranian society is the resiliency that they've shown to continue to move forward and progress and modernize in their own way, on their own terms, despite the myriad obstacles that the government puts in their place. So I'm a true believer, at the end of the day, Iran will be okay. And society is going to force the government to go where it continues to resist going because at the end of the day, the government knows that if the gap between state and society grows too big, then Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall and you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Good. Um, let's move along and see if there's some questions. I see one question right there already. Better? Yep. Closer. Closer. Peter Elliott. Um, you didn't talk about religion, and mm. by that I mean Shia, Sunni, and um, some of the rhetoric that comes out of Saudi Arabia, uh, some of the terrorist actions that occur in Iraq against Sunni mosques. How much does the, uh, the Shia, which Iran predominantly, versus Sunni, the Gulf states. Um, how much does that play in terms of these proxy wars and confrontation? Is that overstated, or is, there, is that meaningful in terms of relations between both sides of the Persian or the Arabian Gulf? Mm. I'm sorry, I didn't say, you say your name again for me? Peter Elliott. Peter, thank you for yeah, your question. Sure. Peter asked a great question. There's multiple parts to it. First and foremost, I want to say up front that it is a self-fulfilling prophecy to talk about Shia-Sunni conflict. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the conflict doesn't exist. There's very clearly a conflict going on. But what I mean by that is that it's, there's nothing inherent in these two very similar strains of Islam that dictates they have to be in conflict. It is political and religious leaders irresponsible and reckless 
political and religious leaders that are fueling this fire. There's countless examples over thousands of years where these two strains of Islam have gotten along very peacefully in a variety of countries, intermarriage, you name it. But when political and religious leaders start to put bad ideas, reckless ideas into people's heads, bad things can happen. So I argue instead that it's the responsibility of those leaders in the political and religious realm to put aside these nonsensical personal biases that they have that are helping to destroy the region in ways that frankly nobody wants. I truly believe that the vast majority of people that are causing physical damage, death and destruction in the region don't want to do that. They're getting caught up in something that is much bigger than them because there's bad people that are convincing them that those bad things are, right to, are the right thing to do. So if those same people that are putting bad and reckless ideas into people's mind start to put more productive and peaceful ideas pertaining to coexistence and building something for the future, then you'd see a different outcome. Same Islam, but a different outcome. So it's important to point out that the conflict exists on a variety of fronts, and it's important to spread culpable, culpability, excuse me out, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Persian Gulf countries, you name it. But it's also important to point out that it's not hard for any of these countries to be more responsible political and religious actors. And I actually think that it's the responsibility of our government and European governments and Asian governments to encourage and, dare I say, hold feet to the fire on these countries to say, if you don't start to do this in a more productive way, there's, we're going to impose a cost on you because the spillover effect is starting to damage our interests. Does that make sense? Thank you, Peter. Good. Another question, what front row there. Um, what, what is the role of Israel in this conflict uh, with their, Iran? How serious a problem is that for Iran? You never know when the Israel question is going to come. Is it going to come at the beginning of Q&A, or is it going to come at the end of Q&A? Usually in the beginning. But it's a good question, and it's an important question. Because like I said, you know, we have partners in the region, and I want to emphasize to you there's a difference between partners and allies. Allies have been formalized into a treaty. Partners have not. So we're choosing to provide security guarantees to countries in the Middle East, like Israel and Saudi Arabia, for example. But we are not bound by it, by a treaty. And that's an important, NATO allies, yes. So paradoxically, if Turkey was attacked, we are bound by treaty to defend Turkey, right? So that, that's an important distinction. Now, the same thing holds true with Israel. Israel is not a treaty ally. Israel is a partner. It's our closest partner in the region, but is a partner nonetheless. Now, since the creation of Israel in 1948, and, I, and, and this is, by the way, what I'm about to say is predicated on a variety of trips that I've made to Israel, both during my government career and after my government career. After my government career finished up, I started to go to what's called Track 2 Diplomacy meetings. You guys familiar with what Track 2 Diplomacy is? For those of you that don't know what Track 2 is, you essentially go to foreign countries and you meet with officials from a variety of countries, oftentimes in my case, Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, European countries, and have conversations that the governments should be having but aren't. And oftentimes, you'll have some government officials from these countries in the room. They don't actively participate, but they sit and they listen. So you have a bunch of former government officials sitting around, liberated by the fact that they're not government employees anymore, who can speak freely, right? They don't have the, remember when I said inject some political realism? You don't have to do that anymore. It's great, it's very liberating. So when I go to these track two diplomacy meetings, I ask the Israelis, what's your concern? Is it ideological? or is it geopolitical? And there's a difference between the two. Ideology is, you know, like, it, it, it's what you believe. It's, it's the core of your being. It's, it's, it's the way that you see the world working. Geopolitics is predicated on interests. It's dispassionate. There's nothing emotional about geopolitics. 
It's very crude, it's crass, it's straightforward. Ideology, you know, it's, it, it's emotion. Yeah, it's pathos, passion. Geopolitics, ethos. Logos, it's very different. Now, some Israeli officials are ideologues. But there's ideologues in every country. We have ideologues, the Iranians have ideologues, the Europeans have ideologues, there's ideologues everywhere. But most Israeli officials are not ideologues. They're cold, calculating, geopolitical actors. And what they say is, since 1948, when Israel was established, we, the Israelis, have had a standing policy that we will not allow any other country in the region to achieve military, scientific, or technological parity with us. Because if they do, it becomes a threat to us. So when Saddam Hussein was building nuclear reactors, they bombed them. Why? He was about to achieve parity. When the Syrians were building a nuclear reactor, they bombed it. Why? Parity. And they got close to bombing Iran. But they got cold feet and they didn't pull the trigger. Why? I would argue because of geopolitical parity. Now, they're very concerned about the geopolitical challenge that the Iranian government presents. They're also concerned with the ideologues in Tehran who spout off ridiculous things about Israel on a regular basis, and rightfully so, right? But at the end of the day, the Israelis acknowledge up front, full scale, when you talk to them, retired Mossad, retired IDF, retired Shin Bet, they acknowledge, they say, the Iranians are extremely rational. And the Iranians operate according to a cost-benefit analysis. And we know that. And we know that there's things that we can do to affect that cost-benefit analysis. I mean, one of the great tragedies uh, of the Iranian revolution, from a geopolitical perspective, is that it broke up um, one of the worst-kept secrets in the region, which was Iran and Israel had a robust relationship with one another. A lot of people don't know that. But they did. And it was in the interest of both countries to pursue that. The reason why they're not doing it now, and this will be the last thing that I say, one, ideology. I don't deny that ideology exists. But more importantly, they're geopolitical rivals. They both want to be the hegemon of the region. And they both view it in zero-sum terms. Zero-sum meaning there can only be one. And if it's not me, it's you. So I have to do everything in my power to weaken and destabilize you so it will be me. Side note, I think that's a truly reckless way of looking at the world. And why do I think that? Let's make this a teachable moment. If I do everything in my power to weaken and destabilize you, all that's going to do is incentivize you to weaken and destabilize me. And then we get caught in a cycle of escalation. And if we don't have an off-ramp, to de-escalate, we're going to go to war. But if we're investing in collective security, if we're investing in the same framework, the same architecture, the same structure for security, then our security, our, mu our, our individual security is predicated on one another, which means we're investing in one another so that we're both stable. And frankly, I believe that that's the only thing that hasn't been tried in the Middle East, and we should try it. Thank you. Somebody else? There's one way over there. I like your opinion about Mike Pompeo. Mm -hmm. Mike's uh, the nominee to be our new Secretary of State. He has uh, the ear of the man you referred to earlier who will make a final decision mm -hmm. about important matters regarding Iran. I'd like your uh, take on Mike Pompeo. Sure. So I'm of two minds, if I can be perfectly honest with you. Believe it or not, nobody's asked me this question in, in any of the television interviews that I do, in all the meetings that I go to in DC, all the presentations that I give, nobody's asked me about this. So on the one hand, I believe that the president should be able to choose the cabinet that he or she wants. However, I also believe that the person that the president chooses should have the qualifications for the position. <laughs> and that's not a knock on Mike Pompeo's resume. 
I mean, Mike Pompeo, if I'm not mistaken, went to West Point. He went to Harvard Law. Um, he was involved in foreign affairs when he was in the House. So uh, it's not a knock on that. The Secretary of State is the face of the United States overseas after the president. And Mike Pompeo has said some pretty reprehensible stuff about Muslims and brown people. And I don't think that we sh can have that on the international stage. Um, let me give you an example of why, OK? Um, I live in Washington, DC. Show of hands, how many people have been to Washington, DC before? <laughs> I honestly didn't expect that many hands. You're all <laughs> gluttons for punishment. <laughs> so I live in a neighborhood called Logan Circle. And on the corner of 14th and P in Logan Circle, there's a Whole Foods, yeah? And because I live so close to Whole Foods, I go to the most expensive grocery store in the city to get my groceries. And one Saturday, when I'm wearing a Seattle Seahawks t-shirt, and a, because I'm from Seattle, go Hawks, and a pair of jeans and blue Chuck Taylors, I'm walking to Whole Foods, and as I'm walking, getting ready to walk in the door, this old guy walks by me and he tells me to go back to my country. And I kind of I kind of <laughs> looked around because I, I, I'm in my country. So I, I looked around and I was like, is he talking to me? And then, you know, you know, a bunch of people came up to me and they're like, ignore him, we're so sorry, da 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 da. It's a microcosm of what we can't have in America's top diplomat. We can't be sending that message abroad, in my personal opinion. So again, on the one hand, is he qualified? Well, he has a lot of the qualifications if you look on paper, but you can't just look on paper. You know, um, I think you have to look at the full package, the full picture. And um, I think this one specific thing, some of the bigoted remarks that he's made, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, disqualify him uh, from consideration in, in my view. However, full disclosure, I think I'll probably end up getting it. But it's the interesting way that our political system works. He probably will not receive a positive recommendation from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Nobody has ever gone from receiving a not positive recommendation to becoming Secretary of State. But once it goes to the floor of the Senate, he just might squeak by. So we could end up having. Now, I know that wasn't your question. And uh, I tried to be as honest as possible answering your question. But I also acknowledge that if you ask 10 other people, they might give you 10 different answers. So all I can do is, is, is use my head and my heart to answer as best as I can. Reza, let me follow up a little bit on diplomacy, since that's a subject dear to my heart after 30 years in the Foreign Service and stuff. But as, at lunch, we were talking about how, what's happened to the State Department and what's the state of U.S. diplomacy right now. How would you evaluate it? Never been worse. Not in my lifetime. Um, so I, I used the anecdote of the military's band having a bigger budget than, than our diplomatic corps. Well, that's always been the case. But, you know, our government is trying to cut the budget. Um, and, and fortunately, we have responsible members of Congress that are saying, no way are we going to cut it to the extent that you want to cut it. Um, we are taking uh, senior diplomatic uh, officials and forcing them into early retirement for no discernible reason. We are leaving senior positions in the State Department unstaffed for no discernible reason. We are taking people with sterling records who have 10 to 15 years of experience serving this country at home and abroad and forcing them to process Freedom of Information Acts rather than giving them substantive jobs to help engage in American diplomacy and achieve American interests abroad. The list goes on and on and on. And the problem with this isn't just that it's damaging American interests now. It is. It's going to damage American interests for a generation. Because not only are we forcing people out, not only are people leaving, we're not hiring new people. So there's going to be a gap of knowledge and skills in the US diplomatic corps that you can't just immediately replace, even if you hire back retired people. Because the incoming classes have been slashed, I think it's 25 to 35% of the size, at a minimum. They call A100 classes. So this is, this is a crisis. And I don't use that word lightly. This is a crisis in American diplomacy that we haven't seen in quite some time. And it's going to take some really heavy lifting in the years ahead to try and fix it. Thank you. Let me go back to the audience. There was one more. 
or question a corollary to this. Uh, um, there, okay. Department of State obviously is probably the person that is primarily advising the president. If others are involved, how good are they? So the, in, in providing advice and, 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 and fleshing out options for the president, the, the Department of State and the senior leadership there are certainly uh, typically uh, very much part of that process, but so too is the Department of Defense, depending on the issue, the Treasury Department, the intelligence agencies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the State Department is one of many pillars that's in place to try and inform the decision-making process of the White House as best we can. And then once you get into the National Security Council, we have a lot of different committees that meet, uh, and, and these committees are at different levels. So you know, they'll, um, how do I describe this in layman's terms? They'll essentially troubleshoot an issue, come up with a recommendation, and pass it up the food chain to the next committee that's at a higher level, and then that committee will adjudicate it, and then it'll get to an even smaller cabal of people who meet with the president to flesh out the issues and make a recommendation, and then it's up to the president to decide. The challenge of emasculating our diplomatic core is you are removing critical, a critical base of institutional memory and knowledge from the decision-making process, which increases the blind spots, which means we could be misperceiving and miscalculating in ways that are needless. It's an own goal. It's a self-inflicted wound, right? For no discernible reason, right? It would be one thing if, 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 if our government came out and said, this is why we're doing it. This is why we're leaving these people, uh, these positions understaffed. This is why we're cutting the budget. This is why we're not hiring new people. But they're not giving a reason. The only reason we've got is, um, you know, you know I, I'm the best negotiator, and you know, trust me. And and I, I, it's not. I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm saying that would be a first. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Somebody right there in the middle. Yeah, Reza, thank you for your presentation. I'm right here. Um, I'm wondering, on the topic of cyber warfare yeah. and Stuxnet, um, if you would comment on when that was discovered by Iran, how, how um, impactful was that on our relationship with them and on any diplomatic efforts? It's a great question. So for those of you that don't know, uh, we used cyber warfare, this program that was called Stuxnet, in collaboration with the Israelis to plant computer viruses that were extremely destructive in the computers and the networking infrastructure uh, in Iran's nuclear program. And, and it really caused some serious damage and it, and it helped set back uh, the progress that Iran was making. It was part of this bigger program called Olympic Games. Now, more to your question. I know it's a clever name, right? Olympic Games. So, but more to your question. The impact wasn't just that we set back the progress of Iran's program. In fact, that setback didn't last that long, as evidenced by the need to decide back in 2014 or 2015, are we going to negotiate or are we going to bomb? Iran quickly found the vulnerabilities, fixed it, and then moved forward at an even quicker speed. Right? The real, the real legacy of that was Iran said, oh, two can play at this game. And then they started to invest heavily in their own cyber infrastructure. So now, Iran is probably a top 10 cyber power in the world. And they weren't when we attacked them. So we've kind of helped create a monster, us and the Israelis. Now fortunately, when diplomacy really began in earnest in 2013, up until 2017, the U.S. intelligence community confirmed that the nefarious cyber activities that Iran was conducting prior to 2013 had pretty much stopped. Kind of goes back to that cost-benefit analysis in the Iranian government that I was referring to earlier. But the reality of the situation is cyber weapons are very different than nuclear weapons in one very important way. When it comes to nuclear weapons, we have a non-proliferation treaty. Like any global treaty, it's not perfect, but it's better than the alternative because only, what is it, 11 or 12 countries in the world have nuclear weapons out of 180-something countries? It's not bad. We have nothing of the sort pertaining to cyber weapons. 
It's the wild, wild west. So until we get together with countries, not just that we get along with, but also countries that we don't get along with, I'm talking about Russia, China, and Iran in particular, to try and set up some rules of the road to make sure, all right, guys, you don't do this, we don't do this, so that we can get other countries to buy into those limitations as well. As the geopolitical conflict escalates between the US and Iran, so too will the cyber conflict. And, and it's very difficult to protect against those vulnerabilities that we have, as we see with credit agencies and banks and national infrastructure and private sector infrastructure being hacked with very low-level technology, very low-level hacking skills. So this is a critical, critical question you've asked, and it's a critical, critical vulnerability that neither Democrats or Republicans have taken seriously to date. All right, there's, I see a question by a student in the back, please. My, oh, oh, hello, my question. Raise your hand, I can't see you. It's way back. Th there you are. My question is that, would you say it's like, would you say it's likely like the, that due to US ties to the Pahlavi Shahs in, a, in Iran, like caused a lot of the early tension, in the post-revolutionary government on both ends? I, U.S. against Iran because they, as you mentioned, lost a sort of ally in their interests and Iran against the U.S. for supporting the guy that they, well, overthrew. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think that I like to, I, I, so I have a, uh, a former boss who goes by the name of Ambassador John Limbert. Um, he's one of the nicest guys and best diplomats I've ever had the pleasure of, of, of working with and getting to know as I'm sure you know John very well as well. And he likes to call what you've just referred to as the ghosts of history. Whenever there is a, a glimmer of hope with regards to US-Iran diplomacy, the ghosts of history enter the room and make something that is already difficult even more challenging. So you're absolutely right to point out that there is a very diverse socioeconomic swath of, of Iranian society that still remembers that you know, we, we very much supported an unpopular dictator in Iran, uh, just like we continue to support unpopular dictators in the Middle East to this very day. However, as I mentioned before, it's a very savvy society inside of Iran, and they're able to differentiate between what's happened in the past and what could potentially happen in the future, and they very much judge us by our actions in the present day. They're mindful of the past. You know, I always like to say that the political memory uh, of people in our country is remarkably short. That is not the case in Iran. They have a very long memory. Like They'll start talking to you about 1906 and things like, you're like, 1906, oh my god, we're, we're not even talking about 2006 anymore. <laughs> so it matters, it matters. But it doesn't have to be an obstacle, as the nuclear deal proved. When interests align, two countries that agree on very little and that have been fighting for a very long time, sometimes in a hot fashion, sometimes in a cold fashion, can sit down and have sustained discussions to resolve problems. We've proven that it can work. We don't have a more toxic, rival, competitor, or adversary on the international stage than Iran. There are some that reach the same level, the Russias and the Chinas, but nobody surpasses. And we proved that we can do it. So it doesn't have to be an obstacle that prevents the, a more practical pursuit of American interests. But it's always important to be mindful of history so that when you go to the negotiating table, you can have a better understanding of what might be shaping the perception of your adversary. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you, Reza. I think we could have gone on forever. But Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I have one second. We have a few oh. goodies from Traverse City. <laughs> I had some of these earlier today. This is very good stuff. From the Cherry Republic, so, don't, so you don't forget. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Cheers.